software development with DevOps. What future am I talking about here? I'm talking about the very, very near future. In fact, the situation is more like William Gibson said, the future is already here. It is just unevenly distributed. I must say I've been privileged enough to work with a number of teams around the world in the past years that practice many of the ideas that I'm going to present to you today. But I'm convinced that these practices will enter the mainstream very soon, and they will almost do so out of necessity. For the future de software development, we will need DevOps. It is not an optional extra. It is something that will become essential. To explain why, I want to rewind a few years. This is what many of us felt about 10 years ago. We adopted many of the agile practices. We learned from extreme programming. We got very good at reducing waste. But in the end, it felt we were in a wheel that was spinning faster and faster, but our software couldn't be released into production. I remember one case from a global bank who asked us to help them improve development practices, like test-driven development, like pair programming, when in fact they had not released any software into production in 15 months. What we said to them is, the least of your problems, it is always good to do test-driven development. It is always good to practice many of those practices, but that's the least of your problems right now. You first need to get that software into production. You need to change. And what we then discovered is, we hit that big wall. Why were we spinning? We were so good. We were good at understanding the requirements. We were good in putting them into features, writing the code for it, self-tested code, code that was continuously integrated. But it was sitting in source code control, where it was of no value to the business. There was this wall that we hit. And we came to, to the wall from that side. Projects. I'm not sure what it is like in Thailand. I've not worked in Thailand. I've spoken to my colleagues who, who work here, but I'm not sure how broadly spread those ideas are. But about 10 years ago, there was this big thinking about projects. And people talked about on time, on budget, being the most important thing. I've been in situations where that was actually the key thing. It didn't matter whether you de delivered value to the business. The most important thing is you could prove you had delivered something on time and on budget. And in the software development world, operations was then definitely an afterthought. People were really just trying to get things out quickly to put it into source code control. It was so bad that one of my colleagues, Ian Cartwright, proposed to take the debuggers away for developers four weeks before the software would be released into production to get a bit of empathy what it feels like to look at the application from the outside to diagnose problems. What we had on the other side of the wall was more product thinking. We had operations people. They were measured on stability and low cost of operation. For them, any new release, any piece of software, any change actually, was something they didn't want because it cost them money and it reduced stability. In some way, they were a little bit ahead. They were already thinking about these pieces of software as products, as something long-lived that changed over time, that they needed to care for for a while. But they were completely incentivized to not want any change. And sometimes, to be honest, I've seen situations where the teams that were writing the software were working for a different company than the people operating it, oftentimes even on different continents. And you can imagine if a team is set up in one way to deliver a project on time, on budget, and the other side is only there to make sure it's stable and low cost, that this clashes. And this really came to a head. And that was the wall that we were seeing why even though following great agile practices, why following ideas from extreme programming, we could not really unlock, unleash the value to the business. And at that stage, it was what, 2010, practitioners got together, a little bit like Ari, when they were talking about the Agile Manifesto. A decade later, people came together and said, there's still something missing here. There's still, we are fighting. And I remember being at one of the early ones in 2010, 
and there were people from the operations, their development teams, and we said, we don't want to fight, we work for the same company, we have the same goals, and yet we keep fighting all the time over this, we need to change. And that was the birth of the DevOps movement, really, to say developer and operations need to work together. Funnily enough, even though a lot of people in the IT space were concerned with this, and were talking about it, having big debates, having meetups, and so on, the business really didn't care about this. What the business cared about was this. They cared about cycle time. They wanted their features out as quickly as possible. They wanted to make sure that when they had an idea, either to follow the competition, or they had a brand new idea, and they wanted to get ahead of the competition, that they could get that idea out as quickly as possible. Of course, they also ultimately cared about reliability and throughput. Reliability here meaning both ways. The reliability of the delivery process to deliver the features that were originally wanted, but also, of course, reliability in the operation sense, that the software was working in production as expected with all the non-functional or cross-functional requirements also met. And of course, they wanted throughput. They wanted to make sure that the teams that were writing the software and operating it could deliver as many features as possible given the capacity that the team had. Mind you, it's important to state, you can have high throughput with very long cycle times. You can release a thousand features once a year that can still be high throughput. And this is, in fact, where some companies ended up in when they were trying to increase reliability. But of course, the big problem then was, even though the throughput was good or acceptable, they delivered a lot of value, ultimately, with a capacity of people in software development. The cycle time was bad. So basically, what was really needed was a way to get all three at the same time. You couldn't do them at the expense of each other. All three of them were super important. Where do we get today? To mention the story of one of the clients I've been working with, they are running one of the largest e-commerce websites in Europe. They're doing more than 500 releases into production every week. They work 40 hours, and they release more than 500 times. And these are not content changes. These are changes of the software in a production environment. We'll probably get to how they can achieve something like that. But let me stress, this is just one example. This is not an odd snowflake. There's a number of many organizations who are delivering at that scale today. A very brief detour, allow me. Why do they care so much about cycle time? We've seen a tremendous shift in the use of IT over the last few decades. In the very beginning, in the 1960s, IT was often seen as just something that makes existing processes a little bit cheaper or faster, like calculating insurance premiums. In the 1980s, we saw more collaboration. We saw desktop PCs, we saw the office packages, we saw the business and the IT people collaborating a bit more. But still, it was in support of the business, and it was clearly, very clearly, seen as a cost center. IT was seen as costing money. It was only in the 1990s that people recognized that IT could be seen in a different way. Rather than first thinking about the bottom line, how much is that costing us, they shifted their thinking around and they started thinking, how much more can I earn by, by having that technology solution? So what they were doing is, they were doing technology-driven differentiation. They were putting products on the market that could really only be on the market because of their better use of technology. They saw this as an enabler. Of course, they had an eye on the cost, but that was not their first priority. If I can make tens of millions of more, it really doesn't matter whether you're spending a few 10,000 more on a couple of servers. And then, of course, definitely from the beginning of the 2000s, we saw entire businesses that were only technology. If you think about a lot of today's big Silicon Valley companies, they only exist because of technology. They didn't have a business like a bank, for example, that is getting better through technology, they have a business like eBay that only exists because of technology. 
Enough of the prelude, let's get to talk about technology. Of course, everything that I said, a lot of people recognized. And one of the answers was SOA, Service-Oriented Architectures. They were an attempt to move away from the applications, the line of business applications, the big packages that companies were using. They failed for a number of reasons, I would say. And I'm using the word fail really. I don't really hear many people talk about SOA today anymore, but I did want to highlight that the thinking was there. What was really crucial was, around the same time as DevOps started, there was a parallel movement that also happened, and it's called microservices. We discovered that writing our software in a different way would allow us to be more competitive, to have that cycle time that I talked about earlier. Very important, though, microservices are ultimately just another service on architecture. Same idea, componentization vice versus ser uh, via services, as people said before. Organized around business capabilities, here's a little bit of a departure. We saw in SOA a lot of really small services. And in fact, I've seen this even with microservices. People forgot. They just say, oh, microservices, they are small services, and they basically just follow older ideas. But it's very clear. There's a paper written by two of my colleagues, Martin Fowler and James Lewis, who described what the key characteristics of microservices are. And these are the ones. You'll see a few more later in the presentation. This is the second one, organized around business capabilities. If you're writing tiny technical services, you're not doing microservices, at, lef at least not how they were intended. Also very important, products over projects. That is also something that we really saw change. And now you see how a lot of those developments happen to go hand in hand. With SOA, we often still saw projects. And what we often saw, I don't know how many of you remember those, the ESBs, the Enterprise Service Buses, there were all these promises, if you just buy this product and if you do a project to implement it, you get all the benefits, but in fact, you just had another unwieldy technology in your business that was causing a lot of synchronization points and ultimately slowing you down. So what, when we talked about microservices, people started to say is, you have to have smart endpoints, but the pipes, the messaging between those services needs to be done. Do away with those enterprise service buses. As I mentioned, a number of people, and as I said, I was, I was quite lucky to be in the right place at the right time. My colleague James was working on a project with the government digital services in the United Kingdom, and they were faced with this idea of how can you improve throughput on a software project? And many of you, including myself, we heard this phrase, if you put more developers on a project that is late, you're making it even later. But our client said, you are smart people, we pay a lot of money for you, do something about this. And what they came up with was this idea to have microservices, to have small services, because they could, to get that increased throughput, to be able to put more people on a software project and make it go faster. Because these services, when they're done right, they allow you something that is called independent evolvability. You can evolve each of the services independently, and therefore, you don't have any, collection, uh, sorry, any connections, any coordination points with the other teams. What that also gives you, obviously, is reduced cycle time. You don't have to coordinate. You can push out a feature for your small service without having to coordinate with a lot of other people. That is actually one of the key reasons why companies like the e-commerce company I talked about can do 500 releases per week. They have the current team that I'm thinking about is about 400 people. They're working, as I said, on one of the largest e-commerce websites in Europe. If you think about 400 people in lots of teams, they can make a lot of changes. And if they can work independent from each other, they can push out those changes. So basically, with microservices, it was a very easy path to get two of the things I talked about earlier. You can reduce the cycle time, and you can increase the throughput. Do you remember there was a third one, reliability? I come back to that later. I briefly want to talk about how do you start with this? How do you start? I mean, you can think, that's all well and good, Eric. You've told me this microservice thing is a good idea. It was enabled because of the DevOps movement. You had the tooling and so on. How do I start? My organization doesn't write microservices. Again, another client that I worked with, what they did is something clever. They looked at the history books. And the history books is probably a bit of a stretch. I mean. Mel Conway, that's the man on this picture, is still alive. He's 85 these days. 
And he wrote something in the 1960s already. And what he wrote was this. And I'll give you a second to read it. The important thing to know here, this thing is often known as Conway's law now. And it is a law more like Newton's law. It is not something that you can choose to follow or disobey and then you have to pay a fine. It is more a description of something that is inevitably going to happen. You know what I mean? The typical Newton example with the apple, the apple will fall to the ground. You can't just say, oh, I'm breaking Newton's law. I'm not going to make the apple fall. Conway's law, and this has been shown over and over and over again, organizations, what their communication structures are, will determine the technical architecture of the systems you build. No matter how much governance you put in place, no matter how many architecture boards, no matter how many enterprise architects you have, you will replace this. And funny side note, by the way, that I believe is one of the success factors behind ESBs, success in business success, that they were sold a lot because you had groups of enterprise architects who were sitting in the center and they wanted something to mimic that organizational structure. They wanted something in the center and they were all too happy to buy those products. But anyway, let's look at the future again and let's look what companies do. So they understand this and what they then see is their actual organizational structure looks like this. They have front-end developers, web developers. They often split in two groups. You have web developers and you have native mobile application developers at the very top. In the middle, you have back-end developers. And you've, I don't know, you've probably seen that too. There's job advertisements out asking for front-end developers and back-end developers. And then at the bottom, you obviously have your databases and the DBAs. This doesn't sound like a place that would be a happy place for independent evolvability. Imagine I want to introduce a new business feature. I first have to talk to the front-end team, they have to program something, they have to talk to the back-end team, the back-end team has to talk to the DBAs, and so on and so on. That will not get you short cycle time because you get all that coordination. So what we do is, oh, I shouldn't forget this. These are number five and six from the characteristics of microservices. What our colleagues observed was microservices, decentralized governance. That doesn't look decentralized to me. They also talked about decentralized data management. And again, it doesn't look very decentralized to me. It looks very layered. And in that layer, all the data is being handled. So what do we do? We do something that one of my colleagues has termed the inverse Conway maneuver. So remember, Conway said the organizational structure will reflect what the software will look like. Now we think, I know what I want my software architecture to look like, and therefore I'm designing the organization so they have to produce the architecture I want. So basically, I'm doing this. I'm turning this by 90 degrees, and I have teams that are completely responsible for the services. They're responsible for the service end-to-end. -end. They don't have to talk to anybody else. These are the so-called cross-functional teams. If you haven't heard about this idea, if you want to know more, there's a great paper that describes how Spotify works, but we also know that Amazon, as a very successful company, AWS, works like that too. They coined the phrase, Werner Vogels, the um, CTO, coined the phrase of the two pizza team. And he means these big American pizzas. And he says the team that is responsible in this vertical orientation should be no larger than a team that can be fed with two large pizzas. So today, we often operate in teams that have 8 to 12 people and to bring all the skills. Not every individual member has to have every skill. Sometimes you hear these terms like full stack developer, full spectrum developer. This is not what we're talking about. We're not expecting somebody to know the details of the React JavaScript framework and to know how switches work in a networking stack. But you need the capabilities and the skills in those teams for them to work independently. More detail. So that all looked very pretty, right? I mean, a few little boxes, colorful boxes on a large gray box. I want to show you a little bit more how that actually looked in reality. In 2005, we had these technology stacks. And this is an arbitrary one, a Microsoft-based stack. You had a desktop, you had a browser with some JavaScript. At that time, of course, we didn't have single-page applications. JavaScript was just a little bit there to enhance some of the experience of the website. 
we had a backend here as shown as an ASP.NET application, a database, and maybe something else to report on the backend. Ten years later, oh sorry, interesting enough also, this is from the actual documentation. This is what at the time still Sun, today it would be Oracle. What they wrote, they had special people to deploy application. I don't know how many of you remember those. They were called EAR files, e files. And they talk about administrators and special people. And you can probably read this. There's a lot of stuff in there that they have to do. And they have to do this every single time you want to deploy something into production. And now think about the example I gave you. If you deploy into production 500 times a week, do you really think that deployer or system administrator is going to have a happy life? If you always email him or put on a file share this ear file and he has to go through all these steps and then deploy it to a server and, you know, it just doesn't sound right at all from today's perspective anymore. But this was the reality. Let's not forget that. Again, going to a brighter future. What we see today looks more like this. We don't really have those stacks anymore. We have a lot of different pieces of front-end technology. We have these microservices. We have a multitude of data storage pods, like areas where data is being stored, but also different technologies, relational databases, non-relational databases, things like Kafka as a message platform that is now increasingly used as a system of record even. And then you start to think, where is my data really? You get these things called a data lake, because now you have the data so distributed, you still want to have a look at it, you still want to discover what data is available, and so on and so on. This was all described in an article by my colleagues that's called Implications of Tech Stack Complexity for Executives. They write exactly what I said in a bit longer version for you to read again if you so want to. And you can see here Jim Highsmith, another signatory of the um, Agile Manifesto, being involved in that. So this is mainstream, this is thinking of people who actually understand what they're doing. What that also gives us an understanding is, I should probably go to the other side, Number seven, from the characteristics of microservices, infrastructure automation. You can only do this if you automate your infrastructure. If again, as I showed you on the previous one, if you have a human being, a person that needs to deploy all and configure all those things, you will not deliver anything. You really have to have infrastructure as code as it is known, or sometimes people now call it everything as code. The idea really is that you describe this entire setup in text files that there's then tooling that creates all the infrastructure automatically. And this again, is, this is where DevOps came from. Who knows about all this infrastructure? The admin people, the operators, the ops people. Who knows how to write code? The developers. How do you get infrastructure as code? By the two of them working closely together. I remember that working with my colleague Keith Morris, who later on wrote a book called Infrastructure as Code, on one of the projects. And it was very clear how we were working together, how we needed to understand, on the one hand, the operations perspective, what needed to be created. But what we developers, I'm a software developer myself, what we developers brought was the knowledge of how to write good code, how to manage code, how to put code into versioning systems, how to diff code, how to continuously integrate that, rather than, oh yeah, I spent five minutes setting up this service, let me just use SSH to get in there, and I'm changing the configuration file in etc slash services, and then you have this Snowflake server that nobody understands. No, for building something like that, you needed infrastructure as code, you needed that description. We talked a lot about what you get with microservices, but maybe briefly, let's go back to what you need to have microservices. Again, my colleague Martin wrote an interesting additional piece to the one that I talked about before that describes the characteristics. And he talks about you have to be this tall to use microservices. He talks about the prerequisites. Because of course, and I think that would be the same for many of you, you read all these articles, you see microservices here, microservices there, you hear all the success stories, and then you see a lot of organizations who say, we want that too. We want those benefits. The benefits I talked about earlier, the reduced cycle time, the improved throughput. And then you're jumping in there. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations tried that without meeting the prerequisites to the point where Martin wrote this. And the idea with you have to be this tall 
is if you have to be in an amusement park, a roller coaster or so, they usually have the signs and they say you have to be this tall for the kids when you, before you're allowed to ride the roller coaster. And the idea really here is before you attempt to gain the benefits from microservices, you should really meet those prerequisites. If your organization can't do these things, you're going to get burned quite badly. Microservices give a lot of benefits, but they're also difficult to pull off in the real world. Fifteen years ago, we could not have done it. Microservices start appearing when we have DevOps, when we have all the tooling that enabled us to do it. It is something that evolved because we could, not because we missed it for 20 years. So what does Martin talk about? He says you need to have rapid provisioning. If the development team or the cross-functional team that we talked about earlier, if they need hardware, if they need a machine, of course, mostly these days meaning a virtual machine, this needs to be quick. And by quick, we mean within seconds. They need to be able to write a script or in the worst case, go to a web user interface and say, I need another machine. The times where you open a JIRA ticket for the ops department to say, I need a new server, and they say, come back in three weeks when we've procured it for you, these days are over. If that is the organization you're in, please do not do microservices. You first need to get to something like that. You also, and I'll come back to that in more detail on the coming slides, you need basic monitoring. The teams that are writing the software need to have basic monitoring for the applications for the services that are responsible for. They need to have access to the data. Again, they can't say, dear operations people, please run this report for me. They need direct access immediately. And then, last but not least, you need rapid application deployment. And by that I mean, again, within seconds. You need to be able, when you've made a change, when the software ran through some tests, and you're confident that it will work, that you can push it into production within a few, let's say, minutes here. But what you definitely don't want is you don't want what was in that manual from 10 years ago, where you have a special person that takes a file you're producing, fiddles around with the file, and then copies it onto some server. That is not what we're talking about here. You need really those three things. And I know that Martin, obviously, as he always does, spent a lot of time talking to different people, understanding what worked, and these are the three things. There's not much else. This is what you really need to be able to successful with microservices. And what he also then goes on to say in the very same article, he says, these three capabilities imply a DevOps culture. Ultimately, you cannot get those three if you're not willing to have a DevOps culture. DevOps is not a framework. It's not a process framework. It's not like ITIL or Scrum or TOGAF or anything like that. DevOps is a culture, it's a mindset of how people work together, and you really, really need that. Trying to do microservices without meeting those requirements is a terrible idea. Trying to meet those requirements when you have a separate development and ops organization is also quite difficult. You may get away with it, but I wouldn't necessarily advise it. But if, for example, you have software development teams outsourced to one company and you have operations outsourced to a second company, then you will probably not be able to get this. I promised you I would get back to reliability. We talked about cycle time, we talked about throughput. Let's talk about reliability again. One thing that we've seen increasingly is this idea, MTTR over MTBF. If you don't know what those letters mean, MTTR is the mean time to recovery. When a problem occurs, be that a failure in your build pipeline, or you notice that something is not going well in a production environment, how quickly can you recover to a normal state? And what people are saying is, we value this more highly than the MTBF, the mean time between failures. A lot of the early practices in agile and extreme programming were around testing, and they are fantastic. I can only encourage you to do this. At the same time, there started to be a mindset, we needed to test it so we could be 100% sure. Perfection, like Ari said in the previous call, perfection. The longest mean time between failure ever. But what they were saying is we can't avoid it anyway. It is contextual. If I'm writing software for a pacemaker or write software 
for the anti-lock braking or the cruise control in a car, I need to have very high mean time between failure. If I'm writing a website for a bank, if I'm writing a website for e-commerce, if I write all sorts of other things, I can tune this a little bit more towards saying the most important thing for me is to recover quickly. This doesn't mean you should get reckless. Of course, you should do everything in your power. You should have unit tests. You should have journey and acceptance tests. You should have built pipelines to make sure that you don't necessarily and unnecessarily introduce failure. But the focus, it is like the value statements from the Agile Manifesto, the focus should be on the time to recovery. What you absolutely need, and I think I've used the word often enough that you know this, you need a testing culture. You need a culture where testing is embedded in the software development process. You have to have QA people who work in your cross-functional teams. You can't again say, ah, we just program something on time, on budget, and then we throw it over to the QA department, they will find the bugs. You have to collaborate, you have that testing culture. I don't have enough time to talk about those practices in detail, but they're easy to find and find more information about. The idea of consumer-driven contract testing and so on. These are all good techniques, proven techniques. And at the very bottom, what is now known as observability. If you have these complicated and complex microservices-based architectures, you need to have a way to get that monitoring. And not monitoring by logging in and with SSH and doing a tail on a log file. You need to understand on a larger picture how that works. One thing that also would encourage you, and that we've seen this with our clients across the globe, when you understand what reliability is about, you want to make sure you can test how reliable your systems are. And this is a practice or a set of practices that has become known as chaos engineering. It was first made popular by Netflix, who made open source or made available as open source software a suite of tools called the Simeon Army. And this is one picture, the chaos monkey. And what that does, it goes into your production environment and it misconfigures network interfaces and it kills servers. Many people, when they hear this concept for the first time, are saying, are you absolutely nuts? Why would I go and destroy things in my production environment? But when you think about it, if you're afraid of doing that, it means you have no confidence in your resilience strategy. You build distributed systems, you have hot standby, you have clusters. If you are confident that that works, that you have resilience and reliability, then you should not be afraid to delete a server every now and then just to prove that it works. And in all fairness, it is easier to do this like a fire drill on a Tuesday morning when everybody is there and knowing it is happening than having an e-commerce website that is failing on Black Friday when everybody is out drinking in the evening at 10 o'clock and then your website falls over. So you really want to test it like a fire drill. And again, I've seen many organizations not only myself, but also my colleagues, we've seen many organizations that are doing that, that are using these tools. There's a bunch of new tools out now called Gremlin. There's one called Gremlin, for example, that really help you with exploring those ideas, this idea of chaos engineering. And that brings us to number eight, design for failure. That was also in the original paper about microservices. That is a key characteristic of microservices. You design them so they can fail. Because ultimately, if you have this large distributed application, there will be something that will fail. To be honest, I mean, Chaos Monkey is one of them. There's different ones. If you're on AWS, there are systems that take out, for your view, of course not for real, for your view, an entire availability zone for AWS. So you can test what it is like. I mean, you go to AWS and you go to a region that has three availability zones because you know that an algorithm that requires consensus needs three nodes, or at most two, uh, sorry, at a minimum two. But do you ever test it? You should. You should really see what happens when it actually happens before you fall in the state of panic when it happens in the real world. So, oftentimes all of this DevOps, microservices, they are talked together in the concept of public cloud. Is a public cloud really a prerequisite? I would say not necessarily. It is much, much, much easier if you're in a public cloud to do all of those things. Infrastructure as a code is a million times easier. To have a DevOps team that can deploy applications is much, much easier with the three big cloud providers because 
they are very mature, there's good tooling, there's scripting, there's things like Terraform around that add another layer of abstraction that allows you to do all the things that I talked about very, very easily. But you don't have to. As long, and this is a set of criteria that comes from the National Institute for Standards in the US. This is how they defined cloud computing. This is only one definition. I mean, cloud computing, as you all know, can mean a million different things. Sorry, a million different things. I'm listing that here because I do think that they really are quite spot on. You need on-demand self-service, what we talked about before. If you need a server, if you need a machine, you need to be able to get it. Broad network access, you need to be able to get through those machines. You don't want to open a ticket in a system to say, I need this firewall to be opened, and then you wait three weeks for two teams to say, I opened the firewall, and, but there's another one, and they're saying, no, 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 I opened the firewall, I don't know what's going on. You really need broad network access, you need to be able to access those servers. Resource pooling, of course, is one of the features that sells the public cloud, the idea that you can have a server farm, and depending on which team needs more capacity, you can shift the servers easily. Rapid elasticity is often very, very important. If you want to try something and you say, I need 20 more servers, you can get them. I've seen this. I mean, I remember somebody who said, we are building an internal, a private cloud. And the next sentence was, how many servers do we need? And I said to him, Boris, we are talking about rapid elasticity. I'll tell you we need 50 servers today. Tomorrow morning, I'll come in and say 80. This is the rapid elasticity we are expecting here. And that is, of course, much, much easier to get in a public cloud that has tens of thousands of servers in one region. And again, I talked about monitoring and observability. You want a measured service. You want to be able to see who is using which resources, oftentimes also linking that back to the cost that is incurred for operating a service. If you can do all those things, you can probably do a private cloud. But it is very hard, trust me on this. I normally would not attempt to do this unless you absolutely have to. I've seen too many people, and I thought about putting the logo in, but I didn't in the end. I've seen too many people say, oh, Kubernetes, that's what Google uses. It's open source. Let's just install a Kubernetes cluster, and then we have a private cloud, and we don't need those public clouds anymore. I don't have to fill out any forms. I don't have to worry at all about security. And then they start. And then it's completely understaffed and under budgeted. You get like five people and they expect you to produce a private cloud in two months. We've seen this before. We've seen teams building private clouds and you probably need like 30, 40, 50 people for a year to actually get to something that is only remotely close to what your development teams would otherwise get by going to a public cloud. Really please understand that while the software itself, the building blocks are available as open source, Installing them and making them work on real physical servers is a hard piece of work that is usually completely underestimated. But sometimes, and I've also seen this, people go there willingly because they're afraid. Operations teams are afraid that the public cloud will mean they lose their jobs. And then they invent all sorts of excuses why you can't use a public cloud because then they know their job is secured because they can build a private cloud. When you think about DevOps, these operations people should actually work closely together with the development teams. They have no reason to fear for their jobs when you go to a public cloud, but they are, and then they make these statements. To wrap it up, these are four key metrics that are proposed in this book called Accelerate. If I can recommend one book to you, that is the book. It came out last year. It is based on the state of DevOps reports that have been around since 2014, and in this book, the authors of the State of DevOps report, which are also well worth a read, are summarizing a lot of their findings and they produce them on reasonably scientific footing. So this is not conjecture, this is not some hypotheses that some eccentrics have, they're really showing how they questioned hundreds and hundreds of organizations and people and on the results came up with some conclusions. And the core conclusion is this one, four key metrics. They're saying these four key metrics are predicting with high accuracy whether an organization has a good and well-working IT, and then they also correlated that with the business success of the organizations and also found a correlation. So if you measure those four things and you're improving, there's a very, very high chance that you're also improving your business overall. Lead time, 
is slightly different than the cycle time I talked about a lot. Lead time here is how quickly from putting a change into version control, how quickly can I get that out into production. Deployment frequency I talked about a lot. How often do you deploy something into production? Mean time to restore is a variation on the mean time to recovery I talked about. And you can see this here too, it's in here. And again, I, put, I set it to you as a conjecture, as a statement, but they are actually showing with numbers how they arrive there. And then last but not least, change fail percentage. How often do things go into production that actually fail or how often do your builds fail? Interestingly, they put this together in a table that did a lot of cluster analysis with the data. I'm not going to go over all of this, but the key idea really is that there were some clusters formed. And as I said, this table is in the book. It's in the State of DevOps report. It's all freely available. There's much more information that I can convey in the few minutes I have for this. But you can see on the left-hand side, this is the future I talked about, the future that is unevenly distributed. There are these companies here today. They can release into production on demand many times a day. It takes less than one hour to get something tr through the build pipeline into production. It takes usually, these are median numbers, it takes usually less than an hour to fix something that is broken anywhere in production or in the build pipeline. And their change fail rate is between 0 and 15%. Interestingly, the laggards on the right-hand side, and there are companies who are much worse, this is just the median figures, you can see, interestingly enough, their change fail rate is not lower, it is higher. It is higher. You might think, oh, if we only release every month, we can have real thorough testing. We can check it out thoroughly in a QA environment. But in the end, the numbers show a different picture. The real world numbers show that the companies who are releasing very seldomly have a higher rate of, change, also of, of changes that fail. And to leave you with one passing thought, we're talking about the future. Here's another thing. Remember I talked about the wall between the development departments and the operations departments? Guess what, there's another wall. And the other wall is between the development teams and the teams who do the user experience. Oftentimes, again, this is outsourced. You have companies who do nothing else but user experience design. And what we are seeing increasingly now is that wall being torn down as well. That we see the design people, the user experience people, work very closely with the development teams. The first people who talked about it publicly were Airbnb. I guess you know them, a big internet company. And they wrote a blog post in which they call this practice, unfortunately, I have to say, design ops. They should have called it des dev to make it clearer. It is the designers and the developers working closely together. But it is often known under the term design ops these days, and it's addressing the other side, if you will. Not from development and operations, it is from development and the user experience side. And what we're seeing here is the same I guess the same approach is being taken again. With DevOps, you got the developers bringing their coding skills to the operations people who knew the domain and you got something like infrastructure as code. You got this, these Phoenix servers, the automatic setting up of entire environments and so on. And now here we see the designers and the developers work more closely together. In ThoughtWorks, we recognized this about 10 years ago. We started hiring our first user experience experts and today, we have over 150 around the world. We are 6,000 people. We have over 150 user experience people in our organization that deliver software because we know we have to have them. That in itself would be a sizable or credible user experience agency, but we know we have to have them together. And what is even better is, this has been around for a couple of years, and again, in certain niches. This is not widespread yet, but it is becoming more widespread. There's new tooling that is arriving. There's something called storybook.js. So rather than your graphic design teams creating a Photoshop file that they're putting on a share and the developers are trying to reproduce the look of the Photoshop file with HTML, sounds similar, right, to the DevOps thing, right, where the developers were putting a file on a file share for the operations people to deploy it. So rather than having that Photoshop file being sent back and forth, what we now have are people who are working collaboratively on storybook.js directly on the actual user interface that works, that is responsive and quick. There's even tools like Lottie that allows the design people to export uh, animations from 
Adobe After Effects into JSON files that developers can then use immediately in the native iOS and Android applications. So again, they don't take the uh, um, After Effects file, look at it and reprogram it, they can work on the same artifact. So this design ops is the next step also. DevOps is hitting the mainstream, design ops is probably the outlook for many organizations to come. And with that, thank you very much.